I can remember, I don't know how old I was, I was fairly young, and it might, it might have been in the springtime, I've forgotten the actual circumstance, but I do remember what my mom told me going out the door. She said, don't jump in any wet puddles. <laughs> Even as young as I was, I'll use a word that I didn't use then, I could see the incongruity with that. What other kind of puddles are there, Mom? So, but it was more just the idea, kind of, it's a mom's admonition, right? It's a mom's warning. Maybe it's a warning, you jump in the puddles, you know, I don't know what she would have done. But don't step in any wet puddles. Well, for sure, it was a reminder, so that when I did see a puddle, I had a choice, right? I think I jumped in anyway. Well, this is what I want us to look at a little bit today, is just a, a remind. This is a remind. Now, in English, we would not put the hyphen in there. We would remind, remind. But in some ways, I put it this way, to, in some ways to help us to recognize that there are some times that we need to, re, just like you need to rewind a clock, I have five clocks that I wind on a, on a Saturday you know, that keeps the spring wound up so that the time keeps. That's just a tradition that I grew out of my dad having all kinds of clocks. So I rewind the clock. I give it some strength. But I also, it's the idea that remind is almost a change as well. So it's to recall, to bring back, to present. It's kind of the, oh yeah. How many of you ever have oh yeah moments in your life? Oh yeah. I get that. I remember that. To be of a new mind, we see in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16, we read this, but the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Now, this, you need to hold this, brothers and sisters, when you're out among a bunch of people. What we do here and what we represent here makes no sense to them. We'd like to think that it all makes sense to everybody, but it doesn't make any sense to them because they're still in a natural state. Natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. But we, but he who is spiritual, praises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord who will, that he will instruct him? But we have, and there it is, we have the mind of Christ. So we're reminded to remember, but we're also supposed to be reminded a different kind of mind, operating in a different kind of way of thinking. It's to replace. To remind is to replace the old with the new. Our brother Scott, a couple weeks ago, Romans 12, 2, where we read this, and be, do not be conformed to this world. This is, this is the strength of culture. Culture does this. Culture gets us to be conformed. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. So again, our mind is the, is the gateway to our being. And how do we use it and who informs us of that? It's a reminder to be reminded. That's what we have here. Reminder to be reminded. Where do you get the thoughts that you process during the day? Where do they come from? Where is their source? So Ephesians 4, we find out that Paul, we just, in fact, we just, great prayer of, of Paul's that we just had as part of our responsiveness this morning. We read in Ephesians chapter 4 that this is how Paul says, So I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. Now, we're not supposed to be out there judging the people out us, the natural people around us. All oh, those morons. How many of you used dummy this, this week with somebody? Don't they know what they're doing? Be careful. Be careful. Arrogance and ignorance shows up commonly in our lives if we're not careful but he goes on to say being darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart 
Well, then shouldn't we judge them because they have hard hearts? Absolutely not. They're just doing what their mind has brought them to do. And having become callous, they have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. Indeed, if you have heard of him and have been taught in him, just as his truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteous holiness of the truth. So as believers, we are transformed people, not superior people, transformed people who have and are learning the mind of Christ, who are learning what it is to think his way, live his way, walk his way. I came across a definition this week of culture that I had not heard before, and I I, I, I kind of appreciate it. It's this, culture. Spontaneous, repeated pattern of behavior that never sleeps or takes a break. What kind of business culture does the United States run on? It's, I can say it in numbers. 24-7. 24-7. Constant. Go. If you want to buy something at 3 o'clock in the morning, can you? Is it part of our culture now? Is, is it just, it's just spontaneous. It just keeps going. It's repeated patterns of behavior that never sleep or take a break. In some ways, that's, to me, that's a good way, a simple way of seeing culture. Sometimes we, we paint pictures of culture and we get really scared of it. But again, if we have the mind of Christ, we begin to see things the way they are and recognize them. And then we also begin to know that we don't have to be afraid of the culture around us. Instead, we are to be his witnesses within this culture of a different culture of a reminded culture, having the mind of Christ. So I come this morning in the spirit of 1 Peter 1, 12, and 13. Um, Towards the end of his life, the apostle Peter wrote these two letters, and he said this in in the second one, his last one, therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. See, that's when I come to speak with you guys, I'm not, most of the time, I'm not telling you anything new. I really am not. I'm, for the most part, I'm not telling you anything new. I'm just bringing things back up again. And that's what, Paul, that's what Peter did here. Even though you already know them, have been established in the truth, which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am with you in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. So remind it again. Why are we here? What is our purpose? What is it that we're here for? And I speak to this as far as it is what we are as a church. A local church. Grace Bible Fellowship. This is, this is us. This is our responsibility. Not comparing ourselves to Salem in, in Ashland. Not comparing ourselves to Faith up in, in Bayfield or Bethany out in Mason. Or, you know, I could keep going. Or even comparing myself or ourselves to some of the radio preachers and TV preachers. They're out there. But what is our responsibility? Us, Grace Bible Fellowship. What do we need to be reminded of and have our mind operate on? Well, I just remind you of these things. First, uh, GBF exists for the glory of God. It's on our cornerstone out in the front door. We exist for the glory of God. That's our function, his glory. That's what we're about. The second thing is that we do have a mission, and that's to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ. Our mission is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ. That's that's, That's what we're supposed to be doing. How do we go about that? Well, we have established what we would call a vision statement, and it goes like this. 
Grace Bible Fellowship is a Bible-based church fostering leadership, discipleship, and healing through organized intentional ministries that impact our community. So this is why we're around here. This is why we exist. We exist to glorify him, make disciples of Jesus Christ. Be, uh, we can, that, that implies disciples make what? Disciples. Disciples make disciples. And we do this by, by, and hopefully I'll show you three strands, what I call three strands, three, three major things that I think Grace Bible Fellowship needs to constantly be reminded of, to remember it, but to be reminded to place into our minds that this is why we're here. If you have no goals, what don't you have? You don't have direction. If you have no goals, you have no direction. This is why sometimes when men retire, they're lost. They don't know what to do. They've had something to do all their lives. It's been ordered for them. They retire, and I've known too many men who don't even live out the first year of their retirement because they don't know what to do. Without goals, we will have no direction. And so what are three things, three strands, I would say, that help us to see and help us to be reminded and to be reminded? The gospel of Christ culture, that's what we have to have. Paul says, I, I try to be all things to all men that I may reach some. In 1 Corinthians 9, 23, he ends by saying this, I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I might be a fellow partaker of it. And brothers and sisters, that's what we need to be as a church. We need to be partakers of the gospel. Sometimes I think we get convinced that we're just giving the gospel to somebody. When instead, no, the gospel becomes our mind. It's the way we think. It's what, what motivates it, what brings us forward, what helps us to see. But I have a, a, a picture here of three-stranded cord. So I, I say to you today, today that Grace Bible Fellowship, we need a three-stranded rope of the gospel of Jesus Christ that, that this brings us strength. So do I have that picture of the three strands up there, Emma? Okay, never mind. You guys know what rope is, right? I'm hoping you're not that dumb. All right. Oh, yeah. I just hung myself on some, right? A short one. You know rope, don't you? And it's twined up. And so there's, little by little, it strands and it gets bigger and bigger or whatever. But there's three strands of rope I want to talk today that we have. I could go to, I could go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 about the three strands, but I don't think it actually fits this very well, so I'm not going to make it. But if you, have, if you start cutting one of those strands of rope, what happens to the rest of the rope? And then you get a little bit more. Pretty soon it frays and it's gone. If we lose these three things, brothers and sisters, we lose being rightly minded with our lives Why we're here. What are the three things that I would say, the three-stranded cord that has to be part of Grace Bible Fellowship? Number one, worship. (coughs) Worship. Worship is the first strand. And I'd say it this way, where do I begin, where do I end? Worship of the living God is basic to everything else. Yes, worship is what we participated in this morning in the singing of songs. And you can go back to the, to the Old Testament, and David recognizes that worship was part of the, of the people's need before God. He appointed song leaders. He appointed song, uh, musicians. He wrote songs himself, the psalms, many of the psalms himself. It's part of the worship, but it's just part of the worship. What is then worship? 
because this is the first strand and has to be there. All people worship. I, I, I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that all people worship something. They all, everybody worships something. Something that gives them value, meaning, purpose, whatever you want to say. They honor it in some ways. And so there's just two things. This is a brief look this morning only about worship. <clears throat> Genesis 22, 1 and 2. So just briefly, two, two, two major aspects of worship I want to look at. This is Abraham uh, taking his son Isaac up on Mount Moriah where God had told him. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now, who was it? Somebody in our church says they wake up this way now in the morning. I think that's beautiful. First words out of their mouth when they wake up, get, come conscious, go, here I am, Lord. What a way to meet the day! That's gospel-centered. That's being reminded again. Have you ever thought about those first things that come into your mind in the morning? There's a way to then take that and rechannel it. Here I am, Lord. This day, I'm yours today. Well, Abraham, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Didn't even tell him which one it was. He just knew he, when he got there. So the story goes that Abraham didn't complain, didn't buck. He didn't do anything. He just, he loaded up the donkeys, the servants, and wood, and all the kind, of, and his son, and took off. Well, then it comes to verse 5 where it says this. So he's tied up, his, he's, he's come to the mountain, or the place, place of the mountain, and um, he turns to the servants and he says, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. It's the first time that word worship, as we have it in English, is used in the, in the Old Testament. This is the first mention of that word worship. And we will worship you. Now there's a whole bunch of layers in this story. But both where it says, um, Genesis 22, 1 and 2, and then here, the, the idea of worship, the word there, the Hebrew word is literally to bow down. It means to bow down. If my knees will take it. Bow down. This is at the root of worship. It's to bow down. And when you're bowing down, what are you doing to the person? or whatever you are worshiping. You're submitting to them. And so this is what Abraham did. He submitted, he worshiped, and he bowed down. It's a beautiful story. It's a, it's a story of our Lord. It's one of the types of the Old Testament that we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God, did God spare his son? He did not spare his son. He spared Abraham's son, but he did not spare his own son. And he says this is worship. It's both, a, it's both a physical thing like I demonstrated here. It's a physical thing. I would encourage some of you sometimes when you are praying, you should be on your knees. Doesn't mean that's the way you have to pray all the time. But it's, it's, it's a way in which you recognize and you worship and you bow down to God and you submit to him. In fact, there's one world religion that does this five times a day. And they're bowing down to a false god. Why should we not know that we should bow down? But it's an interior thing as well. It's something on the inside. It's a recognition. So what is pictured here is service. Bowing down is in some ways service because when, Ab when God says, Abraham, take your son, did he say, well, tomorrow. Next week, maybe. Service. 
He served the living God by worshiping him and trusting him. So you have to ask yourself these questions every once in a while. Who made who? Who made you? This is part of the idea of knowing that we must worship. So worship in its root meaning and its word, and not even the word, not even the word itself, the whole idea of worship is to bow down before the living God. A second way we can see this is in Daniel chapter 3, 17 and 18. This is uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they were given a choice. You can bow down, Nebuchadnezzar says, to the image that I have made. When you hear the music playing, when the boom box goes off, you go ahead and bow down here, and your lives, your physical lives, are your own. But if you won't, I'm going to throw you into a furnace. So they were given, it's kind of fun, because they were given this opportunity by the king in, in person, and this is how they responded. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. We don't need to answer you. They, they, they preface this, we don't even need, we don't, it's not even a question for us. It's not even an option. Nothing. No option. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are going to serve, not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We're not going to worship something far less. We're not going to bow down to anything less than the God who knows us and created us. So in some ways, Nebuchadnezzar set up a worship competition. A worship competition. And I could say this. You are competed for. You are competed for. This is why, if, you know, if you're Pepsi and you're Coke, what are you trying to do? You're competing for what? You're competing for loyalties. You're competing for people to take your product. So Satan is also competing for you to keep you in his kingdom in the darkness. And if you're in the Lord's kingdom, he's still after you to get you to lay down your mind for him and just waste it. There's a competition for you. And so Nebuchadnezzar set up this competition and the stakes were their very lives. But these three men said, our life does not consist in what you offer. Our life is given to us by God, the creator. We will not bow down to your worship things. We will, this is what, this is what it is. We will honor God above you. I don't think we think about honor very much. But think about it. What do you honor? What do you reverence? What do you set aside? This is very important because it's at the heart of worship. The idea of bowing down, recognizing, but then that bowing down, have there been men who have bowed before earthly kings and in the interior of their heart not honored them? But when it comes to the living God, it's, it's a bowing down and it's also a honoring him. So that we could say with those three, even if he does not, whatever he wants is far better than what you're offering. Because every day we are offered something. Who's doing the offering? And who's doing the taking? This is worship. This is what we have to be about, brothers and sisters. They, we, could be, we could be locked up, you know, a, a person could be locked up in a cell and never be able to speak to another person and not be able to well, talk about evangelism. He may not be able to disciple somebody else, teach them the way of the Lord, but what can that person in a locked cell always be able to do? Worship. So no matter where you're at, what your circumstances are, 
Brothers and sisters, we are to be worshipers of the one and true living God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and that through the power of the Holy Spirit, be his people here now at this time in this place. Worship him. The second strand I want to talk about that I think, oh, actually, I'm going to back up. I, want to, I came across that this week as well. This is from Dick Eastman. He's a man who uh, had started a ministry. He says, if you want, you know, how many of you think it's hard to pray for an hour? It's like, oh, man, an hour to pray. I don't know if I can do that. He had a simple concept of setting up 12 kind of categories that if you spend five minutes apiece on them, you can pray in, in an hour's time, you've prayed for an hour. But he begins it with worship. And this is what he says. Psalm 115.1, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory because of your love and your faithfulness. And then he, Dick Eastman writes, Worship God for who he is, the one who created you, for his unfailing word, for your salvation, that you were inclined to his purpose. To worship God is to exalt and honor God. It is to acknowledge God for who he is, to exalt God with your words, your whole being, and with your attitude in prayer. Worship him for his name, his righteousness, love, holiness, omnipotence, greatness, faithfulness, omnipresence, his word, his creation, his work of redemption. And as you get to know the Bible more, you find more ways to say, yea, God. That's to worship, is to honor him, bringing back to him the very things that he's given to us in the first place. And then a few weeks ago in a message, I'm just going to repeat a couple quotes here because one of the things that keeps us from worshiping is our arrogance and our ignorance. And Richard Simmons writes this. He, he, he referenced the, in his reference, he's referencing the, what we know as the prodigal son, the one who squandered daddy's stuff and prostitutes and wild living, and then he came, came to his senses. And that's what we want people to do, brothers and sisters. We want to come to our senses, and we want other people to come to their senses too. But unfortunately, this is the way we are with God. We arrogantly think we don't need him and can live just fine without him. We overlook the fact that we're weak, sinful human beings, and living in humble reliance upon him is how we were designed to function. It is too easy for us to see God's will as nothing more than a bunch of rules he has given us to regulate our lives. In reality, all of God's teaching and instruction is like the owner's manual for our lives, pointing to God's deliberate design for the human life. When we follow the owner's manual, our lives flourish. Even those who lose their lives, their lives flourish. Because God is the center. And there is, there's a giving up. Again, I, I, for me, I find that this, this way of looking at it is always so helpful for me. That I live with open hands before the living God. Because when people are starting to grab, and they're starting to grab this and goo this, they want this, they want that, they want this, they have this, and then they start losing it. And then they try to keep hold of it. When it is simply, worship is again in some ways this. Who fills our hands then? He does. Even if it looks like to the world it's junk? Yes. Because it's from him. Simmons also writes this. This is what happens in the lives of so many people. They want to be a Christian, but only on their terms. Oh, I've watched this over and over again. I've even done this. I've even done this. I've done this. I want Christianity. I want Christ. I want God. But who wants to set the terms? It's like a contract. A true believer is one who is willing to surrender the will to Christ and follow him. It means turning our heart away from self and turning towards God. 
This surrender is at the core of repentance and requires us to humble ourselves before God. So truly to worship, brothers and sisters, that's, we take the place of humility. And then we let God fill that humility with his power for his purposes. So worship centers us. It's our perspective. It's his presence in our lives. Praise is our breath. Gospel is our culture. Again, I, I, I repeat what that phrase of culture that I used here a little bit ago. Spontaneous, repeated pattern of behavior that never sleeps or takes a break. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ to a local church. That's our life. That's our breath. He is. See, we've always taken, in some ways we've taken evangelism, we've set it aside as kind of like a separate branch of our church. No, it's not. It's part of the whole. It's, it's taking not, it's seeing people who do not worship God come to worship God. Because that's the goal. Worshiping in spirit and truth. Oh, I'm taking the most time on that one this morning. The second strand that we need to look at is discipleship. And I have, I have two disciplers to look at first. Here's the first one. This is a discipler. That's a Marine DI. He's probably saying very nice things to that young man. I never heard words like those words until I got to San Diego one day. My mom and dad didn't talk like my DI. But I've come to understand that a DI is nothing more than a discipler, a teacher. And he's teaching these young men the Marine way. I have another picture of a discipler. See if you can, this mugshot, who's this guy? Oh, you know him? That's because some of you are his disciples. Now, I don't say that in a, in a pejorative, a derogatory kind of tone. Dave Ramsey is somebody who teaches people about money and how to use it well. But he's a discipler. He's just teaching people simple truths about money and how to use it, how to, to look at it. And thankfully, that most of the time, he's, he's a Christ-centered kind of guy when it comes to that. But the fact is, is that he is somebody teaching somebody else. And that's one of the strands that we have here among ourselves, is that we are teaching. I'm not just the teacher here. Y'all are teachers. Y'all are teachers of other people, or can be, or should be, the way of Christ. That's what we're doing with one another. But we're not just doing it with one another here we're, we're helping other people to see him, and then they then become disciples of him as well. But that's what we do. We disciple. We teach. To disciple, to be discipled always has an element of teaching in it. This is the way walking in it. Isaiah 30, 20 through 22. It's a beautiful. Although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression, now this is, has context within Israel itself, but I think sometimes this has good context in our own life as well. Sometimes God lets us experience some pretty tough stuff in our life because we need to be reminded why we're here and what we're doing. If his children start going off the track, he likes to get people, his children back on track again. So sometimes he brings tough stuff into our life to remind us of what we need to be looking at, that we're his disciples. He, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or to the left. Now, how would, wouldn't that be, isn't that pretty amazing? How many of you like to try to figure each day out? I do. The Holy Spirit has been given, brothers and sisters, to us in some way, shape, or form this way. He'll teach you to walk. Oh, you need to go left here. You need to go right here. But this is to become instructed in his word and to be worshiping the living God. This is something that comes from it. And you will defile your graven images overlaid with silver, your molten images plated with gold. You'll let anything else go, your idols. You'll put away your idols. 
All too often we have idols in our lives that are not the living God. They are a substitute for him. And we put them aside. And we learn how to do this. We see them, we recognize them, and go, oh man, I ain't doing that no more. My heart is towards the King of kings and Lord of lords. But this is a teaching. This is how we teach people too. This is, this is something that people learn as they come to know Christ. Teaching them to do, Jesus said that, teach them to do all that I have commanded you. What? Jesus gives commandments? Well, see, we don't like that word sometimes. I'll just say it this way. He gives us instruction. We should listen to it. He teaches. And that's what we do with one another. When, when you, a fellow believer is in a rough spot and, they're, and they're, they have their heart turning away from the living God, you come alongside them and say, Oh, brother and sister, I'm with you right here. I know what you're going through. I'm just wanna, I just want to testify with you and, I, and with myself that the way of the Lord is good. It may not seem good right now, but it is good. Trust him. Why should it sound strange that being a disciple of Jesus is loving, learning, and leading others in the same way? Why should it seem strange for us to say we should disciple somebody? That's because the culture we live in wants us to believe that anything and everything is okay. And you cannot say anything to anybody else about what is right or is wrong for them. You know what that is? That's Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. I think, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. We have got hordes of people in the United States of America headed to hell. There is, there, some of them have nice 401ks and retirement plans, and some of them have to go to the brick every day to get food. But they're on that road to destruction because they have not been reminded. They have not been born again. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So why should we feel that we cannot teach other people about the Lord? It is supposed to be in our DNA. It's supposed to be our culture. It's supposed to be what we spontaneously do over and over and over again. Be disciples of Jesus Christ here now at this time in this place with these people. And it's what we're supposed to do. It's, it's the life that he's given to us. Many are discipled to their eternal damnation. They're being discipled, taught to go this way on the wide road. So we all have to walk. It's, it's that simple thing again. We all have to walk. We all have to live our lives. What are you walking on? Which way are you going? This is so important. And it's part of what we need to be about as, as a church. Looking at people and how their walk is. So when Jesus promises the abundant life, did he not know what he was talking about? One man back in the 1800s, his name was C.T. Studd. And he had a famous phrase, Only one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's a gospel-cultured mind. Only one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's a gospel culture. That's what we need. We need to be about teaching that to other people. The last strand that I want to talk about quickly this morning is evangelism. So there's three strands that Grace Bible Fellowship needs to have. Worship, primary. Always primary. It's, it's the primary, primary thing that we do. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven images. It still counts today in the same way. Worship me. The second one is discipling, discipleship, teaching, showing, modeling, conforming to the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The third one is evangelism. Now, last October, um, maybe I was speaking out of my mind. Maybe I didn't think this through very well. Um, But I said, in the year 2024, why can't we see 25 people in our area come to know Jesus Christ for the first time? Why can't we, you know, some people say, you can't put a number on that. Again, if you don't have a goal, what don't you have? You don't have direction. Is the gospel what the gospel is? Or is it it just one of many messages that are the same in the place that we live? Why should we not see, as a church, people come to know Christ for the first time? Why not? Evangelism is not an event as much as it is a culture. I grew up with evangelistic events. How many of you have been to a Billy Graham crusade? How many of you have been to revival meetings? You know, there's a lot of these things that become events, and we start to think of evangelism as an event. There are places where the event is a way to do it, but really, all you all that know the Lord Jesus Christ are gospelers. If you know Christ, you're taking who with you wherever you go. You're taking him with you wherever you go. Gospel is a culture. Evangelism is a culture. Again, going back to this definition, spontaneous, repeated pattern of behavior that never sleeps nor never takes a break. And don't get the idea that you're going to become an insomniac Christian. And don't take the weight of the whole world upon your shoulders that you're out to save the world. You're not. We're not. We're just going to be obedient disciples. That's what we're going to be. And we're going to look for opportunities and walk into them. Something that's helped me out a lot of the last couple months is just the idea that I'm not responsible for people as much as I am responsible to them. I cannot save anybody. I'm not responsible for their salvation. But I'm responsible to my God, to them, that I am his in front of them. I am his in front of them, no matter what. So yesterday, two conversations in the coffee shop, two different people. Did I get to share the whole gospel with them? I did not. But I got to witness in some ways that I am, I am his. I'm his follower. I hope there's follow-up conversations with these people. But it's helped me out because I've taken responsibility for saving people for years. And it's not mine. It's not yours. What you are responsible, though, is to him. And if you give your heart to him and you walk with him, you will find that he will use you. And he will give you the strength, words to speak. Well, evangelism is a culture. Um, Acts 4, 19 and 20, Peter's preaching. They had been uh, warned not to do this anymore. Peter and John answered and said to them, the Pharisees, the big shots, whatever you want to call it, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. So he puts it back on them. Okay, are we supposed to obey you or are we supposed to obey God? For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Can't stop. Can't, can't keep our mouths shut. We know what we've seen. We know who he is. We know what he has done. We know what he said he's going to do. We know him. We're not going to be quiet. This is where I think Satan gets us. Oh, what will they think about what you say? Oh, you can't quite say it quite the right way. It's just nothing more. Evangelism is certainly premised on the idea we're just sharing what's, what's happened to us that we've come to know the living God. It's much more than just knowing all the academics and all the ins and outs of theology and all that kind of stuff. It comes down to this whole idea of our relationship with him. Something happened. The the 
Peter and John said, something happened, something happened to us. We say the same thing. Something happened to me. For me, that happened at age 13. Something happened. I I no longer thought the way I used to think. I no longer had the values that I, I was always looking at and the fears that I had. I was so afraid of death. Five years old all the way up to 13, just afraid of death. And Jesus Christ came into my life. And I don't say that I don't have fears once in a while. I, the doctors told me last week I got something growing in here that's not supposed to be here. So I got to go get an MRI in a couple weeks. Going to look at it. And then they use the word biopsy, all that kind of good stuff. And I don't know, I just was sitting in the doctor's office and I was not afraid. I was very thankful. Because he's my rock. And I just want other people to know my rock. That's evangelism. Evangelism is just, do you want other people to know your rock? Do you want, them, do you want people to know him? That's the heart. Technique comes later. All that kind of stuff. You know, I guess a question when it comes to evangelism, it is literally this idea, who should you share the gospel with every day? There's one person you need to share the gospel with every day. I'm convinced of this. There's one person. I'm not talking about any individual out there or whatever. The person you need to share the gospel with every day is yourself. You need to remind yourself of the gospel every day, of what it is that makes you tick as a believer in Jesus Christ, of what he has done in your life, of who he is. Preach the gospel to yourself every day, that I'm saved by grace and not by works. It's no effort of my own. It's simply I I trusted him, and he came into my life, and he's changed my life. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. We're created by a creator. We're not an accident. There's something inside me that is not, it is not at rest. It's not at ease. This is, describes all people. There's something inside them that's not at ease. It's not at rest. They're looking for something. And they won't find what they're looking for until they find the one who created them. The world I create on my own comes up short all the time. I find that no matter which way I pursue, usually I can trace the problem back to me. And so I need to preach the gospel to myself every day. Let it's him, the Lord Jesus himself. And it's an offer. God gives the gospel as an offer to quit doing life on your own and instead turn to him. C.S. Lewis says it this way, now, what was the sort of hole man had got himself into? He is talking about, you know, recognizing that there's, there's a hole inside of us and we recognize the behaviors and all the bad stuff that's going on. You know, this hole we live in. Does the United States kind of feel like it's in a hole a little bit now? It's like, it's, what's wrong? Now, what sort of hole has man got himself into? He, man, has tried to set up his own to behave as he belonged himself. In other words, fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. This is so important. I hear people say, I'm not perfect. Thank you very much. Neither am I, but we we need another way of seeing it. In the words, fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms laying down his arms, surrendering, saying, you're sorry, realizing you have been on the wrong track and get ready to start life over again from the ground floor. That is the only way out of our hole. The process of surrender, this movement, full speed astern, is what Christians call repentance. Full speed astern. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I don't own a boat. That's not the normal direction we like to think about, but that's the direction we got to go before we're right with God. We've got to lay it down. We've got to surrender. And now, those of us that know him, we need to help other people 
by giving the message so that they can surrender too. So there are three, three strands that need to be part of our church constantly. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily like these, these wall plaques that say God, family, country, church, or whatever. I don't like them. Because I don't know how to split them up very well. If you got the first one, everything else falls in place. God first. Everything else comes underneath that then. Everything falls underneath worship. But those who worship him will teach about him. They'll be taught and they'll teach. And those who worship him and teach and are taught will show other people who he is. Those three things need to be part of our church. So I'm about ready to leave on a 10-day sun-filled vacation to Florida. So I thought, you know what? i got to talk to my church before I leave. And this is just a reminder, brothers and sisters. This is what we're about. We exist for the glory of God. And we are worshipers of him. And we are followers of Jesus Christ. And we're encouraging other people to become followers of him too. I hope that's simple enough that it keeps us in a culture that's spontaneous and repeats the same thing over and over and over and over. Amen? Amen. So Lord, I thank you for these people this day. And Lord, I pray for this church that we may be worshipers, we may be witnesses, that we may be workers in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.